he gestured at me just as I was holding the, the phone trying to get through to the office in London uh, with his gun and he co cocked his Kalashnikov in very aggressive fashion and uh, waved it at me and it was pretty clear that what he was intending to do or threatening to do uh, was wait until I was on the phone to the office and then he was going to either fire the gun right beside me or belt me in the face with the gun or something. Piracy had been going on in the Gulf of Aden ever since the late 90s. What they used to do was they would hijack the ship and they would effectively steal the ship's crew, if you like. They would take the crew hostage and hopefully extract a ransom. A photographer colleague and I um, were sent to Somalia um, to do some reporting on the ground, about to really just try and find out a bit about how the pirates operated. We went to a town called Basasso, which is on the northern Somali coast. Uh, and um, that was a place where you could see a lot of pirate money coming in. Um, you see people driving around in brand new SUVs, big new villas going up in what is otherwise a very, very poor part of the world. Uh, I also knew it, was, uh, it could be a dangerous place for Westerners to visit. As a Westerner, you stand out. There's not many foreigners in Somalia and uh, what you tend to do is to, to stop yourself getting kidnapped is you hire a group of bodyguards. You pay them about 20 bucks a day each and they carry a Kalashnikov each. You have seven or eight of them and they follow you around and the idea is that they just deter anyone really from making any kind of attempt uh, to kidnap you. Can you tell me how they kidnapped you? Yeah, well, on the very last day, we suddenly got a different bunch of bodyguards. The, all the bodyguards had to do was to drive us to the airport. Um, so we thought, fine. Um, we drove off, and uh, we were in um, uh, one pickup truck, and the bodyguards were sitting in the back of another pickup truck. All of a sudden, as we were driving through one of the outskirts of town, the bodyguards' pickup truck shot in front of our vehicle and uh, forced our vehicle to halt and a couple of the bodyguards jumped out waving their guns and shouting. Then the bodyguards ran towards our car, pulled the doors open and ordered both me and uh, my colleague out at gunpoint and at that point I realised, oh shit, we're getting kidnapped. They um, dragged us over into their pickup truck, they stuck us in the front cabin and then we drove off at top speed out of the town and into a desert area. The car drove across the desert for about 40 minutes and then drove up into um, the foothills of a, a range of mountains. Uh, we got to a point where the car could drive no further, just at the top of a gravel track, and we were ordered out of the car. Um, and just, they said, right, start marching up this track, up a canyon. Um, it was a very, very empty area. Um, uh, I couldn't, didn't see another soul anywhere around. At one point, we stopped after about a mile in a clearing. And uh, um, I remember one of, the, one of the guys looking at me, and earlier on, when I hadn't been walking fast enough, he'd sort of pointed the gun at me and went like that, you know. Uh, as if to say, right, if you don't keep walking, you're going to get a bullet in your head. Um, and so when we stopped at this point, I thought, mm, maybe maybe they're just going to kill us. Maybe this isn't a kidnapping. Uh, and one of the kidnappers reached into a bag that he had over his shoulder. And uh, to my surprise, he pulled out a, um, a few Mars bars and um, some uh, bottles of drinking water. And he said, here, drink, drink, or whatever. And it was at that point we realised that they were going to keep us alive, although we had no idea what they were going to do with us. Can you tell me what your day-to-day -day life was like? Well, it really was like, pretty much like living like a Stone Age man. We had um, no TV, no books to read. Uh, we weren't allowed to use a paper and pencil or anything like that. So there was very little way to spend the time. Um, then the food we had, we ate um, goat meat, uh, freshly cooked goat. Um, and uh, rice each day. That was pretty much it for um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then we had nothing for um, uh, you know going to the you, you going to the bathroom with at all. Uh, they recommended using a stick to wipe your rear end with, which oh, no no a stone, 
uh, which uh, I didn't really fancy. So you just use your hand, unfortunately, and a bit of water, but this was the same water that you were having to use to drink with. We were guarded at all times by about eight to a dozen guards. In fact, they were a very disciplined bunch. It was like being kidnapped by an army unit of some sort. Well, I had no reason to believe that they were, but they were extremely disciplined in everything they did. What was your relationship like with your captors? And one of the things they say is try and form a relationship, a bit of a rapport with the kidnappers, um, the idea being that that will make it more difficult for them uh, to kill you. So I remember about three or four days into the kidnapping, uh, we hadn't really spoken to the kidnappers much at that point, and um, they, they didn't speak any English really, I didn't speak any Somali. Um, the only language we had in common was Arabic. I, have a, I speak a few words of Arabic and they spoke a few too, so that was kind of how we communicated. And um, on about day three or four, one of the guys, a young guy called Faisal, he came up to us and he pointed at me and he said, uh, you, from where are you? And uh, so I said, I'm, I, I thought I'll just be honest. So I said, I'm from Britain. Uh, and he went, ah, Britain, Britain good. David Beckham, Paul Scholes, Manchester United, uh, Thierry Henry. And I thought, oh, wow, you know, the, the international language of football um, spoken even here in the mountains of Somalia. But it, it gave us all a bit of a laugh. It made you realise how strange the situation was. About four or five days into the kidnapping, we were uh, led to the top of a mountain near the cave where the kidnappers were able to get a reception on their mobile phone. And uh, they told us to call um, my office in London uh, which I duly did. One of the kidnappers, um, a guy we used to call the old b uh, because he didn't like us and he was old, um, he, uh, he gestured at me just as I was holding the, the phone trying to get through to the office in London uh, with his gun and he told me, come and, he gestured as if to say, come and sit at my, you know, just in front of me because he was standing just a few feet away. Um, uh, and he co cocked his Kalashnikov in very aggressive fashion and uh, waved it at me and it was pretty clear that what he was intending to do or threatening to do uh, was wait until I was on the phone to the office and then he was going to either fire the gun right beside me or belt me in the face with the gun or something or do something so that when I was on the phone to the office I'd be screaming like, yeah, do what you f got to do to get these people out to get these people off me to get me out of here you know or whatever and that was a pretty scary moment the other kidnappers at that point actually dragged him away from me and they dragged him down the mountain aside and I just ignored him I sat where I was and they um, I got through the office and I just said look we've been kidnapped but we are still alive um, and we're not being mistreated we're being held in a cave in uh, in some mountains somewhere but that was a big relief to everybody back home because until that point they had no idea or they had no certainty that we were still alive. But I remember from that moment onwards being pretty scared of him and thinking like, you know, these guys might start torturing us uh, if they wanted to. And uh, that was, that, that made me, that put the fear of God in me a lot. Whilst you were being held hostage, did they ever make any threats to sell you they did at one point threaten to sell us to another pirate gang uh, who were operating further down the coast. One morning, um, a couple of guys who uh, were clearly not from uh, the, the gang that was holding us uh, turned up at the cave. Um, there was a bit of conversation in Somali, so we didn't know what was going on, but um, we could tell it wasn't friendly. And then all of a sudden a commotion uh, broke out and uh, our guys started pushing these two visitors out of the cave. And someone at that point pulled a handgun, I don't know who it was, whether it was our lot or the other lot, um, and fired it into the ceiling of the cave. This bullet, I remember, it bounced several times off the walls and creased the mat on which uh, my colleague and I were sitting. Outside, we couldn't see what was going on, but we could hear gunfire. These two guys who had been kicked out suddenly reappeared on a distant cliff edge that overlooked our cave um, with a couple of their colleagues, and they started firing down 
into our cave with their own guns. It was like being in a, some Wild West movie, there's bullets pinging around, all this sort of thing. Um, to make matters worse, um, uh, one of the kidnappers who was with us then decided that we would be safer if we were actually hidden behind some rocks outside of the cave. There was a big pile of boulders there. So uh, he got a big machine gun uh, with a bullet belt uh, that he wrapped around his shoulders, looking like Rambo, and said, right, come on out, out this way. So we followed him out, and um, uh, he hid us behind these boulders and um, uh, said, like, lie down in that space there. Unfortunately, this, this set of boulders was also the place that we'd been using for the last couple of weeks as our main toilet area. You know, I've got a choice here, either um, lie down and in a pool of my own sort of and piss or keep my head up and risk getting it shot off. Um, and I think it's fair to say that was a kind of, that was a low point in the whole thing. Were the pirates putting a price on your head? At one point they asked for money for us, they asked for three million dollars each. They told the kidnappers that as we were journalists there was no way they were going to pay any money for us. Um, and that uh, you know we were there to write about the problems that were going on in Somalia at the time, and that you know if uh, people kept on getting kit foreigners who visited the country kept on getting kidnapped, that would only make Somalia's problems worse. Can you explain how you were eventually freed? After six weeks in captivity, uh, we were told by the kidnappers that we were finally going to be freed. We weren't told why we were getting freed. Uh, we got a phone call from London uh, saying, um, tomorrow morning you will be taken to a rendezvous point elsewhere in the mountains and you will be met by um, a group of uh, Somali clan leaders who have agreed to act as go-betweens in the situation and you will be handed over to them. And there was about 50 guys uh, there, um, all armed to the teeth with rocket-propelled grenades, belt-fed machine guns, anti-aircraft guns mounted on the back of pickup trucks. It was a small army. We were driven up um, over a mountain pass um, where we stopped uh, and told to get out of the car. And then we looked down into this valley and at the bottom of the valley we could see um, several other cars um, driven clearly by these um, clan intermediaries, or so we were told. And the kidnappers pointed to a path that was leading down to the bottom of this mountain pass and they said, uh, walk down there with your hands up and uh, don't make any silly moves, we'll be right behind you. Um, so we duly walked down this um, path, hands up like this, expecting to hear bullets suddenly erupting at any minute or, and that the whole thing would end in disaster. Uh, we duly got down at the bottom and um, uh, we were handed over and uh, uh, one of these um, Somali elders, a um, uh, sort of elderly man in a suit, uh, he said, ah, you know, um, welcome, you are now free. I remember there was a moment when we were handed over to the, uh, the clan elder I turned around and I looked at the, the lead kidnapper and I thought, well, what are you supposed to say or do in this situation? You know, are you supposed to sort of um, uh, uh, tell them to f*** off um, or something like that? Uh, uh, and, you know, hope that you'll see him in court one day? Or do you sort of say, well, actually, you know, he didn't mistreat us too much. Um, he was actually quite professional about the whole thing. Um, maybe shake his hand? No, I don't think so. Um, uh, and just as I was making up my mind, wondering whether to just kind of nod farewell, he turned away and marched up the hill anyway without so much as a second glance. Do you feel any anger towards them? I feel anger towards them about, you know, what they put my family through, uh, which was hell. For some people it's seen as really the only way of making a living. Uh, but on the other hand, I met many Somalis um, when I was that out there before we were kidnapped, who were saying, look, we are really worried about this piracy thing because we have a generation of young men who are growing up thinking that kidnapping and hostage taking are the only way uh, to lead, a, le uh, to make a living. And, uh, you know, th that is no future for our country. I was actually out having dinner um, uh, with some friends and um, I got a phone call from my dad and, um, 
uh, we have an agreement where that if you ring once, you're just calling for a chat. If you ring twice or more, then I know there's something wrong and I need to actually stop what I'm doing. So uh, the phone was ringing um, and I answered the phone and I, I heard his voice and I just said straight away, like, Who, who's dying?